thank you very much for agreeing to this <clears throat> interview. I'm very, very honored. I did not know that you were dying when I contacted you. So it's uh, uh, that you would share uh, even just a little bit of this kind of sacred time with me. I really, really am honored by it. Thank you very much. I followed your work for a long time. Uh, we're all dying, Jason. Yes, indeed. And my first question, if you're so comfortable, of, is uh, for those of us who aspire to die, <laughs> what is dying like? It's the same as living. Um, yeah, I'm under the notion that pre pretty much people die as they live and they they live as they die. I, I don't really see any difference between um, this thing called life and death. And because life has always been a mystery to me, um, so is death. You know, they're interchangeable, one and the same. Um, you know, I feel pretty intact about it. Okay. I watched the interview that you sent me on your Vertical Pool YouTube channel. So I got kind of a sense of where you're coming from. And at least from that interview, it seemed that you were completely clear headed about it and not um, particularly afraid or, or anything like that. No, I'm at, uh, I'm actually at peace with, um, uh, myself, the situation, and um, in a sense, riding a tsunami of um, grace. And uh, looking back at my life, because when I first heard the news, um, about a week before my 70th birthday, back in November, it triggered a whole chain reaction of memories from uh, kindergarten all the way to the present day, almost like a, like a fiction movie uh, unfolding episodes. And it gave me this uh, insight as um, my life as a fiction rather than a nonfiction or some kind of documentary, because I'm a filmmaker. So I, I actually think a lot in terms of fiction, the truth of fiction, the ecstatic truth of um, how to tell truths by telling stories, basically. And what I realized um, then and now, especially now, um, was that the life I've lived has been dictated by my dreams. I have followed my dreams for as long as I can remember. And the phenomen phenomenal thing is, is around um, I guess around the age of 17, I had this kind of um, breakthrough in my thinking. I was uh, kind of an acid head as a teenager. This is way back in the 60s when almost everybody that I knew was an acid head. And I realized that um, the currency, the, the true value of my life was not going to be money, but it was going to be time the time of my life actually looked more valuable, looked like the true currency rather than, than money. So I had to figure out how to achieve the time of my life by not, um, basically not getting a nine to five job. How do I uh, hustle my way through um, until I can figure out how to make some money just to get by so that I could have my own time, so I could own my time. and. The reason being is because at 17, I knew pretty much exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I had a vision of basically creating uh, experimental theater uh, that became my passion early on. And that's pretty much what I did throughout my 20s as, uh, as a result of making, um, making an art out of poverty, uh, you know, doing various hustles like, you know, uh, dealing cannabis, uh, teaching piano to children, clowning at birthday parties, basically just enough to get by as long as I could completely own my own time. So to make a long story short, I kind of am kind of into rambling a little bit these days, so I've got to catch myself. Right. Um, that, um, that momentum continued all the way through my 30s and 40s and 50s into my 60s, meaning this process of having a dream and dreams to me has always been 
about art and living the art life and out of the art life creating theater and then later writing books and then going on to making films for 30 years, pretty much 30 years straight, making feature art films. And so what I'm saying is, is that um, my life feels um, rooted in a foundation of grace as a result of realizing most of my dreams and the power of dreaming um, uh, at once is overwhelming and so beautiful, it just brings me to tears sometimes just to realize how significant of a choice that was early on to follow my dreams without compromise. Um, and what the, the payoff it ha is having at the end is extraordinary. And so that payoff is that sense of grace or of satisfaction that you made this decision? Um, satisfaction, no, I'm not really um, a big fan of satisfaction. I would say a, a profound peace of mind. Okay. Yeah, peace, peace of mind and uh, gratitude, uh, kind of a bottom line. If I could say what my bottom line is in existence, it's gratitude. There's nothing below that. It's, it's like the well, the wellspring is uh, uh, gratitude. And so I feel uh, lucky. I feel blessed um, uh, and at peace. So yeah, no anxiety. Uh, it's not a fear thing. I mean, I fear. I don't like pain. And I'm not in pain right now. I'm not in pain management or anything like that. I'm in symptom management, um, which is great. You know, it's, um, I never, I've never been on steroids before. <laughs> uh, but, How's that but, for you? Yeah, yeah. So, but they they alleviate the symptoms of of the disease enough for me to um, buy some time and write a book. And actually, right now, I'm just editing a a movie, a short film. Uh, that I hope to have uh, released on uh, YouTube with all my other films are all on YouTube, uh, maybe in a, in a few weeks or so. Great. And that's the Vertical Pool channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also verticalpool.com, my uh, website, um, you know, pretty much lists almost everything um, people might want to know or not know about me. So I'm primarily familiar with your work through um magic and eighth circuit model and bob wilson and i saw you speak on it at the bodhi tree uh, i think probably more than 10 years ago, more probably almost 15 years ago now um but i've obviously been doing a lot of research into your paratheater uh, in preparation for this interview which clearly is where your this is your life's work this is your passion and one thing that i wanted to ask you is as you're as you're going through this process I'm curious how it's informed by your theatrical background. Do you see this process as almost like a theatrical process or even a ritual process? Well, yeah, um, I look at it as initiation uh, in the true sense of the word of uh, entering an experience uh, of which I have no previous knowledge of, uh, no previous maps, no models, no categories. And so as in any true initiation, you go in naked, basically, you go in and you're impacted by novelty and have to pretty much, um, you know, find your most, my most honest responses to what's happening moment to moment, because it's, it's mysterious, it's new, I have not been here before. So uh, initiatic experience, for sure. And paratheater work, um, which um, spanned for my own experience, 42 years of um, facilitating probably a few hundred people overall that came and went, but also doing the work myself um, has, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. There's a, uh, it's a kind of a ritual technology with a series of, of methods by which when applied are capable of triggering uh, states of consciousness and uh, unleashing forces in the body as movement resources through which uh, dancers, actors, performers, even non-performers can find a way to subject themselves to their own energy and allow that energy to propel and compel them into 
movement signatures, uh, vocalizations, gestures, spontaneous eruptions of sound and so forth. But within that ritual technology, there's a crux method. There's something central to it that separates it from every other ritual technology I know from, know about. And that's something we call no form, uh, which is a, um, which refers to um, a standing position, kind of like a Qigong standing position of um, vertical rest and balance, but it's, it's there to um, uh, establish a, a place of internal uh, receptivity, uh, borrowed from Zazen, but not sitting because uh, this is a stance that's a precursor to movement. You can't really, you can't, uh, you can't if you're sitting down, you're not gonna be able to move very far. So uh, it's a standing position of uh, cultivating a profound uh, internal receptivity. And that internal receptivity um, enables uh, an individual whose body is significantly warmed up because before we go into the no form stance, there's a very rigorous about a 45 minute physical warm up where the objective is feeling the body deeply. So we're all sweating, we're all warm. And so the body is in its kind of uh, physically active warm state. And then from there, we enter into the shock of intimacy with the void in the no form process. And then from there, the receptivity to these impulses, emotions, uh, images sometimes, um, uh, different uh, tensions, resistances come up and we give expression to those. And then we inhabit those. So it's in a sense, uh, uh, not just moving with them, but diving into our own energy and moving through the space around us and becoming in a sense filled kind of shot up with ourselves in a sense. And to give expression uh, to uh, the internal landscape. And then after each and every expression, we return to the no form stance to release our identification, to let go of whatever energies, whatever forces, emotions, so that we go back to the receptivity of being uh, nothing, being nobody but ourselves. So that no form uh, experience is something I have taken a deep imprint in over the years. So I'm, I'm at home in being nothing. Uh, I'm very comfortable at uh, intimacy with void, you know, that sense of being an expression of the void. It's not just me in the void, I'm an expression of it. Uh, not an issue, not a problem. And that experience, that kind of foundation in me has given a vision. It has come with a vision, which I had not had before, because this is a new time for me, of death as a genesis, um, as a, a kind of, a, a, a more of a mysterious transition rather than any you know, grand finale of banality, you know, like, oh, this is the end and that's it, you know. I'm, so I'm, I'm not like courting an atheistic uh, direction and I'm not courting a kind of religious direction thinking I'm gonna be transported to some Valhalla or some heaven on earth or something like that. So it's neither one of those, but more of a kind of uh, what I would call a Gnostic, not agnostic, but Gnostic mystical uh, experience of uh, no form of um, uh, intimacy with void as as the genesis of uh, new forms, uh, new directions, new life, um, as it always has been for me. This is so profound. I mean, I, having not been directly involved in this process other than watching your films, it seems to me that having spent over 40, it seems as if you sp you've spent over 40 years directly engaging in all of the states that people actively avoid <laughs> <laughs> now some people actively avoid but well, yeah and, <laughs> and that is just uh, profound and uh, you know and and the result of that is very evident i think in just your calm and poise at the, at the current moment but i'm curious uh, how that that experience must have taken on many kind of forms and epochs over over those 40 years of, of kind of 
deepening experience of that and experience working with other people and seeing other people go through experiences and it's, I'm, there's i'm sure no way you can sum the 40 years up in, in a sound bite but I'm, I'm just curious how that process evolved over time um okay well i'll tell you the short story um so before i started i started it in 1977 and for the previous 10 years i was fully committed to the uh physical training of of a particular uh medium of mime theater uh not french mime which is uh, based in ballet and marcel marceau and you know more french um, culture but american mime theater uh, a technique that originated in new york city at the american mime theater um, under the direction of paul j curtis uh, who was not my teacher but i learned his method from one of his protégés um, uh, my actually a childhood friend of mine, Keith Berger, uh, went there and he came back and he taught me a couple of things when I was um, 17 years old. And it just kind of, it was like a game changer in terms of, okay, I was a 17 year old and I was just almost out of high school. I, I wanted a future. I didn't know what it was going to be. And I got introduced to this um, vision of um, nonverbal communication and physical theater that was quite unique um, in that it, um, it's kind of a hybrid of method acting and modern dance. So there's uh, a, a very theatrical and kinetic form of nonverbal communication. So I, I went through some training with Keith and I learned maybe a half a dozen things from him and a half a dozen is a, a small fraction of what the whole school presents so I, I wasn't like you know immersed in the school itself but I learned about a half a dozen methods and techniques and over the next 10 years I learned them very well um, I performed I taught and I had achieved a very high level of uh, self-determination over my physical body meaning being able to uh, in my intention and will move in a particular way, exactly the way I wanted. I knew the way it was going to appear to the audience. I had a high level of self-control over the physical instrument. Well, entering into the paratheta process, it was an absolute brick wall because uh, once I was introduced to the no form direction, I just froze hmm. uh, because their intimacy was void. Um, I'm having to be nothing. I'm having to do nothing. I'm standing there waiting for something to happen. Nothing's to happening. Nothing's, I'm freaking out because nothing's happening. I'm not getting this. And so for several sessions of the same frustration, I realized that I had become very attached to the high level skill and dexterity. It was my thing to make money off of, to be proud of. It was my status. It was everything to me. And I realized if I was going to enter this new direction, I had to start relaxing control mm. in, a, in a way that I hadn't relaxed it before. And I just didn't know how to do that. And then one day, I was staying in no form, something just broke in me, and I just fell right to the ground laughing my ass off. Just hilarious. I was just laughing. It's like I lost control, but it was just the funniest fucking thing I had ever experienced and, and you know the, the guy that was kind of guiding his name David Rose who kind of introduced certain principles of this work in the beginning uh, he kind of came over you are you are right buddy I, yeah I'm fine I, I think I got no form and, and then from, from that time that point on I became um, uh, a kind of um, I went through a kind of a religious conversion experience is what it was because um uh, coming out of it, I started opening up to a level of creativity that I had not known before that included control, but then also opened up to uh, experiences of discovery uh, and uh, dimensions within my own personality that I didn't even know I had. So that was quite exciting. Um, and so for the next six months, I was in a kind of religious conversion point where um, 
I was really obnoxious. I was I was going around basically trying to convert people over to being nothing. It's like you know, I was, <laughs> in social situations, you're you are nobody, but if so am I, and isn't that great? And it, it, of course, it didn't go over very well. Uh, so I, <laughs> eventually, I kind of backed off and realized, okay, I, this is personal. I I gotta kind of keep this to myself and uh, see if I can develop this. I don't need to you know try to convert the world into being nothing. The world already is nothing. <laughs> That's great. And so that was, you You consider that an initiatory experience? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was, any any time I'm experiencing something I haven't experienced before, I call it an initiation. And, and especially if it um, if it's a kind of a game changer or a life changer where I see and looking back that I didn't go back, uh, I didn't return to my career as a mime I then begin, began um, committing to this new form, and but also not only committing to it because a small group of individuals that was experimenting with these principles uh, only stayed together for about six months and then they ban disbanded. Mm -hmm. and, and then I was the only one that wanted to continue. So what I did was that I started to um, integrate my previous mime training and some of the exercises and ideas there into this new direction. So it became this kind of hybrid of physical theater and ritual together. And that started developing into my own form, which was then um, documented in uh, about 10 years later in a book called All Rights Reversed um, at, at Falcon Press. And then that book stayed in print for about 13 years and I upgraded it in the year 2003 to towards an archaeology of the soul, which I uh, self-published. And then uh, more recently in 2020, um, I distilled everything I know about this work over the last 40 years into a slimmer, more distilled volume called State of Emergence, uh, Experiments in Group Ritual Dynamics. And that's currently published on the original Falcon Press. Uh, people can find it there. And that's, that's the one to get. Yeah, that's the that's the book that uh, probably closely, most closely codifies uh, the methods, uh, the principles, and it presents a series of five ritual structures laid out at five levels of difficulty, so that you can test yourself to see how far you can go, given your commitment. And it can be worked, you know, solo or um, or in groups of about anywhere from five to ten. So once you get it up all the way to the highest difficulty setting, what does that look like? And what that <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> so you have any stories you can be comfortable sharing? Well, um, the, the book, the, the level five uh, is what I call the Muses ritual, which um, uh, uses the uh, ritual technology to... Um, uh lay the groundwork for um those individuals who are artistically inclined uh to begin establishing their own personal muses dialogue a dialogue with the muses archetype and i don't look at the muses archetype as oh this is my muse or your muse so the muses uh, i look at as an impersonal autonomous like a daemon so to speak and um it's different for each individual too, because you know, uh, depending on the temperament and the nervous systems and the motivations of the artist, uh, they're going to have a different approach. But we went through this muses ritual for ten years. We did uh, a ten-year stretch of almost pretty much all muses labs, and each lab runs about three months, meeting anywhere from once to twice a week for ten years. So we were fully immersed in ten years of. Um, uh, experimentation with discovering, well, how um, might we um, find the receptivity to this dialogue is really what it is. When I say dialogue, I don't necessarily mean verbal dialogue, but some kind of call and response that acts as a powerful force of inspiration to the imagine imaginal faculties and the artistic temperament. And over those 10 years, pretty much every film I've made um, was based in images, characters, and stories that emerged out of those dialogues. 
So what was the difficulty, the length of time commitment, or was it the emotional impact of the work or just being with a group of people for that long? Well, all of the above, uh, the difficulty oftentimes uh, can be summed by the level of commitment. The force of commitment has to be strongest in the more difficult rituals. And what I mean by the force of commitment is the, um, uh, uh, the single-minded 100%, um, nothing less than 100%, maybe 110%, commitment to the legitimacy of your own subjective experience without the thinking machine coming in and saying, well, maybe this is, you know, second guessing, or maybe this is, you're going the wrong route, but fully committing right or wrong to whatever experience is happening and discovering along the way, um, you know, what gels and what doesn't gel. Um, so the commitment level pretty much defines the difficulty and also, um, probably, um, hmm. see, there's, there's stages after the muses ritual that move into uh, performative uh, skills where this work has been elevated to a performance standard, uh, most of which have happened here in Portland over the last um, eight years, uh, where we um, staged five different um, uh, paratheatrical research uh, uh, productions, uh, you know, each one framed by a specific um, poet, the, the, the writers of, uh, I, I, uh, you know, Rambo and, um, you know, William Blake and Sylvia Plath. And, you know, our final production was called Escape from Chapel Perilous. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we use the uh, poetry of Sylvia Plath as, uh, as the sermons uh, spoken by the uh, preacher in the Chapel Perilous. And if you know anything about Sylvia Plath's poetry, uh, you might be able to imagine how fucking, f fucking fitting that is. Yes. The abyss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cold and dark and uh, uh, distant. Maybe that's a good segue. You have had a huge influence on the, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, the more codified or traditional occult scene. And I'm curious to ask you about magic. Is that something that you came to as, as part of this process? Did you come at it directly? Did you come at it tangentially? You obviously still include a lot of occult stuff in your movies and, you know, have published on you know, Falcon Press and and done books on the Eighth Circuit model and and so forth. But uh, my my sense of you has always been that that is a kind of a side concern to your theatrical work. So I'm curious how you look at it. Well, that's that's really true. It's more of a side concern to um, my theatrical work, yes, but even more essentially to uh, how to how to live a, a an art life, how to live creatively, how to stay creative. That's probably be my um, uh, my main focal point. And then if I can stay creative, I can participate in creation. But if I can't stay creative, it's just, you know, it's a dead, it's, it's, it's dead art. And I, I don't do well with dead art. <laughs> I die. Um, so you mentioned magic. I don't know what you mean by magic. Why don't you tell me what you said, what you mean by magic? <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly everything that you've been discussing is magic. I've written okay. technology, getting into getting into I, I would say everything you've been describing of getting into states of suspended reality where you are outside yourself and having initiatory experiences. I mean, that's the the purest I can describe it. Um of course there's the more kind of as my mentor, you know, I, my mentor was Genesis Peoridge, as, as she used to call it, the Museum of Magic, more kind of traditional codified uh, Crowley and uh, and so forth approach. Well, um, so I hear what you're saying. Um, appreciate your reference there. So I've not, uh, I'm not a big, haven't really been a big reader of magical texts like Crowley and uh, John Dee and you know the whole lineage of uh, Western ceremonial magic. I'm, I'm somewhat estranged from. Um, 
I'm gonna put this the uh, it's for me it's been about uh, a way of life and an experience of time uh, because I've never had a nine to five job and I've gotten by, uh, like I said, in my twenties, you know, on various hustles. And then I figured out how to write books in my thirties and the books started generating income. And then that income allowed me to teach the things in the books. And so it kind of grew from there. I figured out money, but just enough money to get by. Cause I never really wanted to make more than I needed. You know, I'm very much, um, kind of a low maintenance, um, materialist, very, very low maintenance materialist. And I like it like that. I like being kind of broken, happy. Um, and so I've lived along a parallel timeline, parallel to the uh, nine to five punch clock timeline that has structured the lives of many people, millions of people. And they live in a particular trance you know, a certain hypnosis, just as I also live in a certain hypnosis or trance alongside of it. Um, so there's this kind of parallel life that I've been living. Uh, and I'm not the only one living there. I know other people who have done what I've done. And, you know, we find each other. <laughs> and we, we, sim we swim in the same pools and so forth. But for the most part, I'm part of a minority. And in this timeline where I own my own time, there is a timeless time, uh, an experience of time that is not defined by uh, seconds, minutes, or hours. And it's a timeline that um, uh, uh, informs the way I physically move through the world. Like I never rush. I stopped rushing a long time ago. And I never have a problem. The only problem with me not rushing is other people wanting me to speed up. <laughs> they were say, can you, quick, can you do this? I, no, no, actually, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm actually taking my time. <laughs> Uh, your problem, you know, you're, you're rushing, your problem. Um, so there's been a, a slowing down, a kind of what I would call, um, uh, I'm on the, uh, it feels like what I call zero speed of nature. Mm. And uh, so I'm following, I follow my own rhythm, my own pulses, uh, my own whims, um, and because I have all the time on my hands, I have all the time that I've set apart, I've had to be very clear about my intention. What do I want to do with my time? You know, what, what can I, uh, what do I have to offer? That's a, always a big question. What's my contribution? Because it's never been about fulfilling my dreams alone. Um, the reason being is that pretty much all my dreams have um, been married to, um, uh, teamwork processes, except for writing books. But when the books go out, my dreams are linked to the dreams of people who read my books and then have a response to them. And some of those responses are life-changing. Some of them are reactions to me. So there's dreaming happening on a larger collective. So it's not just about my dreams, I've realized. It's always, um, and even, you know, the people that I work with, my films and, and theater, you know, they, uh, they come into the process. I, I cast them in a role in, part, in a very particular way where I look to see, well, what is their dream? Where are they headed? Um, what role or what catalyst would support them moving forward into the place that they're already moving? That kind of like my, my MO. And so I cast, yeah. Like in a facilitator role. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I, I work with actors and non-actors alike in this way. Um, so I'm a kind of a uh, a dream task person. You know, I'm I'm here to uh, give dreams to others uh, within the context of my dreams, and we're all dreaming this together. And the, it comes across as a film that then we show to a, a a theater full of people that we never met all these strangers come and watch our dream that we created. So it's a kind of a, uh, a beautiful convergence of my own personal dreams with the collective dream body that I've come to know as dreams. My dreams are not just personal, but I'm saying, um, I think I start again a little bit off track there, but I just wanted oh. to, kind of reiterate this uh, 
thing is that it's been clear that it's never just been all about me. There's just this constant connection with not just local community, but non-local community, because my books, I got 11 books in print. And my, my publisher, he won't even tell me how many people are reading them. He just says, you don't want to know. So I just, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Cause I, I don't, I don't have space in my head to have these ideas like I'm famous or whatever. I like my head actually being empty. I don't like filling my head with much of anything. I see. So that sounds very much like a, a magical or alchemical process of dreaming things into being, which um, I'm guessing maybe you, I mean, do you see those things go out into the world and then come back to you in new forms and take on their own life? Yeah, sort of, you know, in some ways, like recently, um, you know, I um, uh, came upon this interview that you talked about on YouTube uh, with this uh, Brazilian fellow who um, apparently had found my first book, Angel Tech, about 12 years ago when he was um, a teenager. There's a chapter in Angel Tech, my first book, that uh, it's, it's, it's about ritual that I was doing at the time related to paratheater. Um, and later developed into that first book, All Rights Reversed. Anyway, he was doing those methods for like 12 years on his own. He hadn't contacted me. He heard I was in Portland doing these weekend intensives occasionally, which I, I didn't do before. It was always these long labs, but these weekend intensives. And he flew in from Brazil and joined the group and he really stood out because he was the only group, only person in the group that took to the work like fish in water. It's like, where did you come from? Because this work is not for everybody and everybody else here hasn't done it before. And you're just like, you're in it. And, and he explained to me, you know, his story. Hmm. And after he um, came out of the workshop, now he was really also watching how I worked, how I facilitated, because I have a particular style of um, interacting in, with group ritual dynamics as a director. And he went back to the Brazil and over the next four years, um, he had uh, organized uh, a series of groups of nine, 10, 11, and led his own paratheater labs based on what he knows from experience and watching the things that I've done. And we've been having a email correspondence. So there's a kind of accidental apprenticeship that has occurred there, which is kind of lovely because I didn't have any assumptions of having an apprentice or even this work continuing after I'm gone. I just, you know, you know how sometimes certain teachers, they do something, they preach something, and then they're, they pass away and they're, the followers are trying to keep it together, like with the Gurdjieff movements or, you know, various teachers. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right. Right. Because sometimes the teacher carries a transmission that is necessary to the work. Right. And I always felt like maybe that was, you know, part of what I did. So I thought, okay, when I'm gone, that's it. And then this guy comes along and says, no, I, we're going to, we're going to keep it going. So, so he's going to do his own style of it, which is great. I, I really like that, but he's going to use my book, uh, uh, State of Emergence as a syllabus uh, to, uh, as a reference for the people who are working with him. Uh, so that's one way in which some, um, well, there's been a, a, a pretty big impact and uh, and I would say uh, because the work is clearly not for everybody I mean over the years uh, it's been very common that someone would be coming into like a two-month lab meeting once a week and after three or four sessions in they just drop out because right. for for various reasons it just you know it doesn't work yeah I want uh, to ask you about that um, so I didn't want to interrupt your thought if you, you were you no I, I'm, I'm, I'm on uh, yeah let's go on <laughs> right. yeah I wanted I just wanted to ask you about that because you you've mentioned a few things you were kind of talking about since you've lived life in the self-directed way that you have kind of stepping outside of the social trance or at least the standard one or the standard so, social trances I think there's quite a few of them um, and also I, I was just thinking about that and kind of creating these suspended states of reality uh, through ritual. And then also you're kind of mentioning 
working with non-actors and then people kind of coming in and perhaps uh, completely taking to it or just kind of, you know, disappearing after a little while. And so I'm kind of curious what that's like, because it kind of seems like you are creating the, as it just as an outsider who hasn't seen this firsthand, it just seems to me hearing you talk about this, it seems like you're creating these bubbles outside of standard reality for people. And I'm really curious what that's like for people entering that, particularly ones who've never had an experience of something like that before, and what the kind of what emotions you see come up for them, what becomes challenging, why people take to it, or why maybe they freak out, I don't know. Uh, these are all great questions. The, um, uh, the work uh, of each session um, is initiated by what's called uh, an asocial climate. And I explain this to everybody that uh, uh, is interested in participating. Oftentimes we'll have a, an interview or I'll talk with them or even by email, explain to them uh, what to expect. And what I mean by asocial, it's not um, antisocial, it's not social. It's like this third point. Um, so oftentimes, just uh, automatically when uh, you know a person out in the world enters into a situation with a group, uh, the social kind of circuits in the nervous system light up, you know, the, the, the social needs, the, the, the need for uh, uh, recognition, hey, how are you doing? Let's, you know, let's catch up. Or uh, the, the signal of, oh, I'm attracted to you. That, that, well, maybe we can get together and have some coffee or something afterwards. Or, uh, oh, this looks like a like a place to, to make a friend, or this is finally my sangha, my community. These are all kind of social needs that uh, sometimes uh, get aroused when people enter a particular group because they're looking to meet their social needs. They're really important. Social needs are, are essential uh, to um, the, you know, the human experience, just to feel like yourself. You, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know you have friends, a uh, place to belong, a sense of community and all that. However, all those social needs act as an impediment to what we're discovering this work. So to set up a situation to bypass um, social considerations, social needs, uh, certain directives are introduced in the beginning. And the first one is to don't talk. Uh, this is a primarily nonverbal medium. So with language um, being one of the most intimate uh, expressions of culture, so without, the, without verbal language or already starting to relax the cultural influence of it. And the first thing that they do is that they put their clothes and things off to the side of the room and they enter the workspace and they simply start physically stretching and orienting themselves. Uh, one of the first um, directives that um, begins to amplify the asocial experience is something that I call space forming. And that is everybody stands uh, on the periphery of the room and they simply stand in a kind of what I call the no form position. We, I introduce that stance to them, kind of a position of vertical rest and just emptying. And then at that point, there is a directive of moving forward into the space and getting your attention off yourself and putting it on the space itself. And so this is the first directive, get your attention off yourself, put it on the space, not the things in the space, like not the furniture or the lamp or even the people, but the space itself as a value. So this starts um, spatial awareness. And then you got maybe a group of 10 people moving into the space, nobody relating with each other because everyone's not relating with the space. And as they're, as they're navigating the space, they're also starting to navigate the spaces between people. So, cause nobody's relating to the space and what this has is an overall field 
of spatial awareness is that each individual is starting to feel or sense their own personal space being respected and amplified. No one's violating it. No one's crossing into it. In fact, everyone's moving around it or somehow relating to that space as space. So this, is, this begins um, a way of relating and interacting that is clearly beyond the social consideration for what people do in groups. Relate to the space, relate to the space between people. Um, it almost carries its own kind of shamanic, I mean, I'm almost reminded of something I read in Carlos Castaneda's books early, early, way on in my early 20s, where uh, I remember Don Juan was talking about um, uh, uh, paying attention to the shadows. You know, you're working, you're walking through the desert, and you don't pay attention to the light, you just pay attention to the shadows. And by just honing in on the shadow world, so then you come into some experience uh, of a different quality than just if you weren't looking at the shadows. So we're not looking at shadows here, we're just simply shifting our attention off, off ourselves. And that's, that's the um, probably, uh, in some ways, the most difficult thing for some people to do because they can't get their attention off themselves. They're so self-preoccupied or fixated on, oh, how do I appear? My self-consciousness is killing me. And what do they think of me? And you know, this kind of thing is, you know, very part of the social trance of um, trying to please people or trying to measure yourself against what other people think and all that is this kind of, you know, pretty common stuff. So that can be challenging. And, you know, people who are overthinkers, I criti uh, what's the word? Uh, overthinking casualties <laughs> so yes. that don't do well in this work at all. Um, but then those individuals who are kind of happily, I would happily get my attention off myself and put it on the space. They love it. It's just like, oh, what a liberation. I don't have to, you know, get, you know, I can get over myself. And there's a certain, I think a certain uh, joy that can come, come from that. So that's how it starts. And, and then from there, uh, we enter into a physical warm up period of, um, as I mentioned earlier, about 40 minutes of feeling the body deeply. And that begins the no form process after that of uh, once the bodies are warmed up to, um, you know, begin experimenting with uh, uh, accessing internal landscape. Uh, and again, this is all nonverbal. Uh, throughout the process, throughout the three hour process, there is um, sounds, vocal creations that come about. Sometimes words will come about because just as part of people's mindset a word will be there or a phrase will come out but it's not like an intentional thinking 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 it's it's more about uh uh allowing uh uh the mind to almost uh up chuck <laughs> it's just like whatever what's what the mind wants to say just let it go let it let it don't fight it um so yeah the nonverbal part the space forming part uh, relating to the pathways between everybody rather than the people themselves uh, initiates the asocial uh, climate. Later on in more advanced stages of the work, we do enter a very particular kind of interaction called asocial interplay, where there's a way of actually interacting with each other from um, a place of heightened vertical integrity um, that is quite rare and beautiful when it occurs because it's, it's a form of um, uh, interaction that's um, not based on wanting anything from anybody. What would an uh, example of that be? What, say what? What would an example of that be if you could describe what that looks like? Yeah, so to first of all, we have to kind of uh, imagine moving through um, advanced stages of this work. And what that means is becoming more proficient at uh, accessing the internal landscape and giving expression to that movement and getting better at surrendering to sources of energy within you and raising your own energy on your own. So you become re responsible for your own creativity or your own creative state. And so, and this usually takes that kind of advancement 
some people will come into it around session five or six or seven, uh, some, some earlier. But basically, when you're at a point of um, proficiency at sourcing energy, embodying a source, and being in a process, an active process of moving across space with that embodiment, there is a, a way of accelerating the commitment to that energy that up to that point you've just been doing for yourself. You are committing to the experience, the internal experience of your own energy. And there's an accelerant point. Uh, and then that what that happens is that the your own personal energy starts to uh, radiate. There's an emanation. There's a presence that starts coming out. And that presence then has the capacity to act on others. So what's happening then is really you have a room full of people who, individuals who are uh, accelerating their energy and their, 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 their presence is radiating out and it's, and it's acting on each other's presences so that we're, it's an interaction of, uh, of mutual presences acting on each other and being acted on by each other. And, you know, different individuals have different proficiencies and capacities and power. So, you know, you might be out on the floor and there might be someone coming towards you whose energy is bigger than yours. <laughs> right. And, and it's like, whoa, okay. And then you might get tipped, right? You know, it's like, oh, that, that was a big wave, you know? And so at that point you have to recommit to your own source and come back and nah, I'm, I'm back, you know, here's my presence. And there's a meeting of presences. But at that point, you're not taking anything from them. They're not taking anything from you. It uh, becomes an interaction of mutual offerings. And we're, here we're, we're moving towards the total offering of self as a basis of interaction. And this is what uh, differentiates it from um, uh, improvisation as, as is more commonly known in dance and theater and even music. You know, you're improvising with other people. It's always about Okay, you give me something, I'll run with it, and I'm going to give you energy, you run with it. And it's it's very exciting, it's a useful, I love improvisation, I love doing it, but this is not that. This is a whole different um, orientation um, where nobody wants anything from any, anybody else, but there's a, a, a long preparation to raise the energy to a point where you have something to offer that you can sustain, a sustained offering of self. And there's a number of different internal um, methods that help to strengthen that inner capacity for uh, sustaining your own power. That's phenomenal. It, it sounds to me like kind of like a heightened, just like a heightened, exaggerated, higher level version of life. Where <laughs> that's really, that's level really good. Level. Yeah, yeah. Particularly the part where you said, uh, you know, like people's bigger energies are coming towards you and you're having to let, fall back on your own. It's like, well, that's it's, it's, it's funny. This sounds like most uh, most weeks for me. Yeah. That's great. Um, do you have like kind of like a group mind that emerges from that at all occasionally? Uh, it pretty much always, but it's, what's kind of interesting, it's not uh, homogenous uh, because the work starts always in the um, point of the individual uh, and then it branches out into the collective so that any group mind is really a, a, a kind of um, a, what I would call a kind of a miraculous interaction of self-governing bodies that there's a high level of personal autonomy and integrity uh, in the, the, the any kind of group mind that develops out of this so it's not homogenous like we're all we're all one here. We're all, you know, in this all like soup kind of group mind. So it's never really been like that. And so it's as a result, the work tends to attract uh, people who are excited or aroused by um, their uh, their personal autonomy and 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 integrity building. You know, finding discovering, you know, what it what it's like to um, to fire up. A deeper commitment to your own truth so in that experience particularly you said kind of as internal lands landscapes start getting accessed 
what's what does that look like i mean are people are characters emerging or maybe difficult life experiences or traumas coming out i mean what what kind of comes up for people well you know there's uh what i call the inside and the outside you know the inside is what people go through the outside is what it looks like from the outside okay and and so in, in the beginning stages of this work um anybody coming into the room just you know cold from the outside it's gonna it's gonna look almost like uh a staged insane asylum uh, <laughs> because you know, you're going to see people writhing on the floor, uh, weeping, laughing hysterically, uh, running, leaping, you know, all kinds of spontaneous, loud, chaotic. Uh, it's just going to look like a mess. And that's sort of the point to, you know, have that kind of um, personal freedom in the beginning stages. So there's no um, holding back so that you can really begin opening up to the larger playing field of your own humanity, of your own wellspring of what you're capable of experiencing. Um, you know, in terms of individual, like what happens on the inside, that is impossible to say because how do you put that into words? And each person has a different, you know, kind of take on that, um, you know, of what happens. Uh, but uh, through the course, you're in the work long enough. Um, you get, uh, it's, it's, it's common that you get a uh, kind of a boredom or a frustration of just um, doing messy, chaotic movement. You know, it's fun at first, but then it kind of disperses. It kind of just goes nowhere. Like, what am I doing here? It's just, this is like, you know, this is, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going anywhere. So there is this kind of transition out of boredom. People get bored. It was a very important point, the boredom point. Um, and it often coincides with um, the motives why people do this work. Uh, oftentimes in the beginning stages, when they first come into the work, they, they discover something um, kind of amazing is that the work actually gets them high. And, you know, having, you know, been a proponent of psychoactives, I, I took a lot of psychoactives, psilocybin, acid, peyote um, oh a few hundred times early early on like between the ages of 17 and 23 I stopped all these psychoactives when I started paratheater for this very reason because there was something about paratheater that got me as high as psilocybin basically with without the pesky side effects of you know whatever mm -hmm. anyway it gets you high that there is a certain uh, activation of the the light body the nervous system gets lit up and people walk out of the session um, very awake, very uh, enlivened, very, and so they come back for more. I want to get high again. They just coming back. I want to get high, and so the hedonic motive typically lasts uh, four or five sessions, and then it starts wearing off. And so it's like, oh man, I maybe I need a stronger no form, or maybe I need more more drugs or more intense archetype or something because it's just not doing it for me anymore and they're frustrated because of, you know the whole motive of pleasure and ecstasy was really great and it worked but it, it kind of dispersed so then that's that's where the next stage a kind of discussion i have to talk with the group and i share with them okay you know the next level if you want to continue this work you're going to have to move through this frustration and experiment with um, the next octave of of motivation, which which I'll call freedom. Okay. A and the way that we're going to discover that is through uh, shadow work. Hmm. And so the rituals are going to be all designed to expose uh, the fears, uh, the dreads, the embarrassments, the shame that we all carry in ourselves, and that we unconsciously project onto the world or that we uh, crush ourselves with an overbearing inner critic or whatever it is that the shadow we have not become accountable for is somehow limiting our experience of, of freedom because of the oppression of an unclaimed shadow complex. Uh, so, and that shadow work can go on for a while, uh, depending is, is on- this where more people start to drop off? It, it's, it, it ha that's, that has been the case. 
And then, you know, the more diligent uh, people that, you know, that kind of get a sense that this might go somewhere, it's just going to take more work. You know, they hang out, you know, they, I've worked with people that have stayed with me for 10 and more years. And I saw, I've seen the results in their lives. And I was just very pleased as punch to, you know, see that kind of commitment. Um, and so there's that level. And then there's a certain freedom and autonomy that's achieved through uh, increased self accountability, basically, when you become, you know, accountable for your own projections, and you, as a result, you actually, uh, you, uh, you're rewarded with, I think, more perception, less projection, more perception, you, you, you and, but then, as a result of seeing more reality, there's more consequences of becoming more perceptive, how do you live with it, you know, how, how, how do, do you, you live, you mean? what, what, what is the perception that uh, dawns on people? Well, the thing is, is that maybe you have this experience too. You've gone through stages of having confronted uh, projections, whether this projections like romantic projections and, you know, uh, catastrophic love affairs where, you know, you're expecting someone to be someone that they're not and, you know, the heartbreak and all of that projection or shadow projection politically wise. You know, there's a lot of that in the culture today. And you start taking accountability for that. And you start seeing through it. You start seeing through um, the lies of uh, society. You start seeing through the lies of the, edu the public education systems. You start seeing through a lot of stuff. And so that's what I mean by um, opening up the perceptual apertures as a result of increasing self accountability and um, you know claiming you know shadow projections and all that. And that has its own problems because you know how do you how do you live with more truth, you know? Uh, truth can be hard, right? Yeah, I, I'm really curious about this. I mean, particularly undergoing that process, um, that you know, in my own life and in, in my own ways, has that's been the hardest thing, and not necessarily hard to do, but hard to hard to see what you've been doing. It's yeah. true, yeah. And that the must only be, that must be hard for people as they as they go the, through. It's it's hard because there's this uh, a thing I've discovered, and that is, um, without compassion, uh, truth or some truth can feel just like cruelty. Hmm. And whether it's cruelty on yourself or cruelty on others, because you're telling the truth, and this is the truth, and you know. You, and they're in tears. People are in tears because you're telling them the truth, but it's the tone that you told them in that is hurting them. It's not necessarily the truth. You know how what I'm saying is that the tone of something sometimes matters more than the content of what you're saying. Yes. So, so truth spoken with compassion is a very different experience than just hard, cold truth, right? And so uh, that becomes part of the uh, process of you know self-compassion to live with more truth about yourself. Um, and then there's further developments, you know, people want to go further into the work and that's where we go into more um, performative skills, how to um, begin distilling all this messy, chaotic, sloppy movement experiences. How do we begin clarifying the forms and the communication? So whatever's coming through what is being spoken? What is being said? What is being shared? Is there something there of value? Is there something that is worth sharing? And as a facilitator, I'm on the outside, always watching this, paying attention. So I can tell when a particular group is getting closer to um, what I call performative proficiency because the clarity of the articulation of emotion and gesture masks and way they're moving and walk is becoming more obvious and it looks like there's a story that's starting to tell itself through them and so we have a meeting and I tell them what I see and then we have a negotiation we want to move towards clarifying what what's already happening and advancing it um, into an actual public performance and that's uh, that, that distills into the the movies and the public performances yeah, yeah, especially the public performances here in Portland. And there was about a half a dozen that we did in Berkeley during my um, 20 years uh, there as well. Um, 
But uh, I would say about 80% of what we've done in the 42 years was in private behind closed doors. Interesting. Um, I have a bunch of questions came up for me. Um, one was of the people who kind of, this very much sounds like kind of like Navy SEALs boot camp almost, um, but of the people who fall off or decide not to go further, what would you say the biggest thing that kind of the dweller on the threshold that pulls them back is? Is it just, it's not what they thought they wanted social commitments met, or is there an internal fear that people get <laughs> against? Again, it's not any one thing. Um, all those things you mentioned, uh, the asocial climate can feel um, a little threatening if a person is socially frustrated. You know, if they are without friends, without family, they really are sincerely looking for a community. Um, the particular setting, the set and the setting and situation simply cannot provide those needs. And so they discover that pretty much right away. Um, so there's that. And, you know, oftentimes uh, people are overwhelmed by the physical demands of the work uh, that, you know, you have to sweat, you're sweating. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very rigorous physical warm up. It goes through five phases. Uh, and each phase is like six or seven minutes. The first phase is simply being still for seven minutes, any position you want. I don't care if you're standing, sitting, or lying down. And then the second uh, stage is um, uh, flexing your spine. And the third stage is working the core, the abdominal region, bringing heat there. Uh, the fourth stage is stretching the muscles. And the fifth stage uh, is basically anything you can do to generate enough heat in your body to break a sweat. And this whole warm up is done within your own little personal space. It's not like you're bouncing off the walls, running around. It's uh, done within a very contained area so that whatever heat, whatever presence uh, you are generating in the warm up is contained. And so we're practicing a kind of a energy containment physical warm up. Um, and some people really get into that, you know, they really like this, the structure of a physical warm up that brings about the uh, experience of feeling their body deeply, which is for many people, a kind of a novel experience, wow. feeling, you know, meeting the body's central need. Body has a central need to be felt deeply. And there's a number of ways people do that indirectly. A lot of people overeat because it puts more weight on the physical weight on their body. So that they're forced to feel their body. It meets the body's need, but they have to wait. They have to walk around with, you know, 20 or 30 pounds more weight than they, that might be, that, that might be healthy for them. So this is a way to more, most directly um, meet that, you know, central need. And each of, the each of the five phases has a very specific action on the instrument of the body. Uh, like, you know, working the, flexing the spine starts to activate the nervous system and uh, stretching the muscles starts uh, firing up the, uh, the muscle, the neurons that trigger the muscle actions and the stretching. And so each of the five phases um, uh, covers a different territory of, um, of feeling the body deeply. So when the whole warm up is done, you're in a sense really primed for some new experience. And some people, uh, like I said, uh, they're just not up for that. They get too tired, they don't like it. Okay. And I may think of like, there's like a third thing. Um, sometimes uh, the individuals be overwhelmed by a, a inner critic. Mm. Um, overthinking and they just can't seem to escape it you know it just is it, uh the work just makes it uh, unbearable to, it makes them so aware of how uh agitated they have become uh from uh their own state of mind um and the reason this happens is because there's no socializing people are pushed back onto their own experience their own mental states and whatever mental state you come into the room with, 
that's what you've got. And so, you know, people come in, you know, if they're all worried about what's going on in the day or can't get past their fight with their lover or whatever, uh, they're just not there. They're, they can't be in the present. Got it. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the topic of shadow work. Um, and one thing that I wanted to ask you about, uh, if it's all right, um, one of one of the experiences I've had being around people who are entering end of life is particularly if they're, or actually specifically if they're fully conscious and, and there's not something like, unfortunately, um, in the case of many members of my family, dementia or something like that occurring, if they're fully fully aware and just as as is as normal, I feel like they spend a lot of time kind of orchestrating the experience for people around them and making people around them feel better and almost uh, uh, consoling all the people around them, uh, which must be exhausting, I imagine. <laughs> this happens several times. And I'm wondering if this is, if you find uh, people are per perhaps projecting their own fears on you or you're having to kind of like moderate this experience for other people. Uh, no, I'm very clear from the start that I make, I make a bad guru. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the ways I, which I do this is that I demonstrate uh, some of the methods for people uh, in person, but I always do them poorly. <laughs> okay. I, I do them just, just enough to let them know the gist of what they need to try. I'm not, I'm not going to impress them with how well I can actually do it. Uh, cause that doesn't do anybody any good because they're just like, oh, oh, that's so amazing. I could never do that. So I don't do that. So, uh, I blow my cover pretty, uh, frequently, um, for others. And I also make it clear that, uh, I am not, um, a therapist. Uh, I don't even approach the work or present it as any kind of therapy or group therapy or psychotherapy. Uh, it's more of a kind of approaching a spiritual event and uh, a process of self-discovery through movement, uh, sound, um, and self-work, a kind of a self-work uh, uh, directive, in the, at least in the very beginning until you know, uh, a particular group discovers why they're doing it. Because oftentimes people don't know, they come into the work for the first time, they don't really know why, they, they have an idea of why they're there, but they don't really discover the real reason until they do it enough to know enough about what the experience is to realize, oh, this is why I'm doing it. Oh, this is what it is. I, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, so um, my, um, my role there uh, in, the, in the group is primarily as a voice um, because that's how the group experiences me while they're out on the floor. If I'm facilitating, they hear my voice. And so my uh, art as a facilitator is um, to, to learn to speak to the bodies, find ways of uh, languaging my perception of what I see going out on the floor in a way that uh, doesn't get in the way of their process. Uh, so I, I don't say a lot. Uh, my words are very minimal and chosen, just like little prompts here and there. And what I'm looking for, I'm not looking to change anything. I'm not looking to direct anybody, but I'm, I'm dropping down into a particular kind of attention, what I call second attention, actually. It's part of the training of the work, learning different types of paying attention. And I drop down into this kind of what I call second attention, which is simply a, a kind of a awareness linked to presence, to energies, um, without assigning meaning or um, labels necessarily, just to perceive the energetic dynamics as they are. And so what I'm looking for uh, are the kind of like what's bubbling up right beneath the surface of the consciousness of the group, like what is just starting to come up. And when I start seeing uh, elements of that, I introduce directives that uh, amplify what's already starting to come out. 
So I'm really looking to amplify what's innate rather than impose a direction thinking, oh, I want this group to go there, or wouldn't this be entertaining if they if they went this direction? So I don't go there. I do that with, with theater, what went more performative directions where entertainment is a directive, but this work is not about entertainment. <laughs> People may be entertained in their experience, but I'm not there to entertain, uh, and I'm not there to create entertainment. Uh, I'm there to, um, Ampli to help amplify the innate dynamics percolating from uh, the uh, subconscious, so to speak. And the, uh, this relates in a sense to, um, I don't know if you're aware of um, Carl Jung's um, method of uh, what he calls active imagination. Um, exactly. Well, he has a number of ways in which he approaches this process called active imagination um, in his own, you know, therapy and working with psychological transference and, you know, things like that. Uh, it's basically a method for making the unconscious conscious. And so this work uh, employs a highly visceral and somatic treatment of active imagination for making the unconscious conscious. And part of uh, why and how we can do that is that I present this idea to the group as um, the physical body itself being the embodiment of the subconscious mind. Um, the embodiment of all the various biosystems, the blood, the cells, uh, the DNA, the genetic memory, the ancestral currents, uh, you know, the traumas, everything's in the body, everything, and it's hidden, it's you know, under the skin, subconscious, so that the body embodies what I call subconscious. So subconscious to me is not abstract, it's the physical body embodying all that is unknown, most of what is unknown to us. And so the process again of no form acting as a kind of a door opening uh, to that internal landscape of the subconscious and then entering into that dimension of the internal landscape and then um, opening the door for the expression of what comes out. So the conscious ego in this process becomes filled with the contents of the subconscious. Now this is both exciting and also perilous. It can be some, this is part of the danger of it because it's always ego inflation. You know, the ego gets like a balloon, like all of a sudden this huge meaningful event comes out of the subconscious and the ego is containing it. And it's like, oh, isn't this fucking meaningful? I am the greatest person on earth. I'm Jesus or whatever it is. Yeah. It's true. I'm, I'm you know, the Antichrist. Yeah, yeah. Right. Or the Antichrist. Right. And so this becomes part of the experience. It says, well, can it be dangerous? And this is exactly why uh, every immersion in the, um, every immersion that the ego has in the subconscious in this work and the inflation that occurs after every one of those events, we return to no form which uh, acts as an ego corrosive uh, trance breaking device. It, it, it disperses the trance uh, of that, uh, whatever energy was being channeled. You know, it's very hard to, uh, if you're committed to returning to being nothing, that's what it takes. And then you return to being nothing and it's a relief to be, okay, I'm, I don't have to be that thing anymore. I can be free of that thing that had uh, grabbed me by the, you know, curlies. Yeah, it sounds like very much neck and neck with chaos magic, where it's very similar, and then it's banished with laughter at the end. Everyone returns to group laughter. That's wonderful. Yeah, very. Uh, that's I love it. Yeah, yeah, humor. <laughs> that's good. Um, so I I uh, watched the most recent interview you did on your on your YouTube that you sent me, and one of the things you you talk about in there is uh which is kind of incontrovertible is how much at least in america our culture hides death 
and pretends it doesn't exist and is terrified of it. And you mentioned even, you know, the educational system and so forth cultivates that fear because then it can be used to control people. It can be used to run up insurance and hospital bills. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, we truly have a, a horrendous healthcare system. But um, I'm curious that, I guess kind of what I was asking what I was getting at previously was not as much talking about in the context of um, paratheater, but just in your in your life now, whether you feel that people are projecting their their own fears at you. Projecting their fears at me? Yes. Oh, I haven't had that happen in a while. Good. I have had experiences where where people have decided like I'm like the devil incarnate or, you know, these kinds of things because of some um misinterpretation of my energy or my you know appearance or whatever uh i just mean people people get squirrely around death you know us everyone does uh who's us what do you mean uh i just said people get squirrely around death around what around death oh, around death people get squirrely around what they can't categorize mm. nobody knows what death is Nobody's been there unless they've gone through and they've come back and maybe they have a story to tell, but that's also their story. Right. You know, their consciousness, what happened to them. It doesn't necessarily mean you know, someone comes back from death and has a beatific vision of, you know, angels and whatnot, and they come back and they share the story. And there's going to be some people that really believe, oh, wow, when I die, I'm going to have angels too. But they may not. That was maybe their story. That's what happened to their consciousness. So I don't know. I don't know what death is. Um, so what I do know is that uh, uh, I think it, uh, I've traced it back to a kind of a consumerist uh, uh, trance uh, that really uh, took off big time in the 50s over the last 50 or 60 years of, um, of escalating materialism, of being able to make enough money so you can buy whatever you want whenever you want to buy it so that overall there was a kind of um over the decades um a special kind of frustration that built from um too much immediate gratification uh too much getting your own way too much getting your own way because you have the money to get your own way and the tragedy of that i look at it as a kind of a modern tragedy of getting your way too much mm. and being able to uh, having some idea of freedom as a kind of more of a consumerist freedom because i've got the money i can do whatever you want money buys freedom and sort of it does it can but i don't think it, i don't call it a true freedom so the tragedy of it is that the the fixation on immediate gratification has supplanted the sense the living sense of immediacy uh of that immediate experience of direct perception of being able to live life openly with minimal preconceptions minimal assumptions just being able to live openly creatively um and uh and not entitled like the world owes you something so that there is this sense of immediacy when it's restored and it can be restored but it, it takes a certain amount of work to uh expose how deeply you know you may have been entranced in this kind of consumerist idea of freedom and just getting your way too much yeah. uh, so again so the ego gets very fixated very fortified very identified with and people lose uh, connection with, you know, the soul. You know, they become ego identified. They don't know what soul identification is yet. Um, and it's through soul identification that I think uh, where you can restore that sense of immediacy, um, which again, uh, immediate gratification acts as a simulation of immediacy. It's not immediacy at all. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, at best, it's virtual, and it, it's it's very uh, uh, 
temporary. Uh, you get a an immediate fix. You know, like you go shopping, it's immediate gratification. You buy you buy some shirt that you really like, and you put it in the closet, and you wear it once, and it stays in the closet for for like years. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of, that's a rampant. You know, in both men and women. You know, just the things that you buy. And they, oh, and I do it myself. I, I catch myself doing it a lot, and 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 I think that with the consumerist trans people aren't just buying stuff they're also putting bricks in the wall of their own isolation you know, yeah yeah because they're 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 building fortresses around themselves and and i think taking themselves out of it out of a uh, relationship with other people by doing that as time well, goes well also the, the, this the very thing about you know you're, you're collecting more stuff so the experience of space diminishes yes uh, not just in your living quarters, but also in your head and every place else, you know, and you start, you can develop claustrophobia and all kinds of other kind of neurotic reactions to the absence of space, the spatial awareness in your life. Um, Are you familiar with, um, there's a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. She, she hit on something. Yeah, this is phenomenal. I mean, I've done this many times. It's 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 a profoundly, and she actually says this outright. It is a profoundly animist ritual. Yeah, she, Shinto, where you pick up everything everything in your house and ask it if it gives you joy, and uh, and I've done this many times and ended up throwing away things that I reg <laughs> regretted, but um, <laughs> a profound ritual. And I, I think that, uh, but I I remember going through this and I'm thinking like on, only in America can somebody although it was from you know she's from Japan but I was thinking like only in America could you know the practice of throwing away things because you have too much stuff become you know a cultural phenomenon <laughs> it's very yeah strange. yeah it's pretty predominant here and of course you see it in other countries that have um in some ways regretfully um uh assimilated and appropriated uh consumerist american culture there you know that uh, uh kind of damages or dilutes their indigenous cultures you know uh that's it just spreads like a virus you know like some kind of a yeah one thing that i wanted to touch on in, in relation to that in the other interview you were talking about um a couple things i mean like seeing seeing the world as a tragedy and a comedy i thought was was awesome you were also talking about looking at the planet from an almost aboriginal perspective and not the idea that we're even though we have this rampant consumerism and environmental destruction that we're not necessarily destroying the planet and i, I really want to touch upon that because i thought that was that was profound what little you re, you related in that interview i'd love to dig into that here well that uh, aboriginal um insight uh, sp was sparked in me by uh, an Aboriginal elder who was touring uh, from Australia uh, back in the mid 80s when I was living in Boulder, Colorado and writing for um, uh, a local newspaper there. And I was called to interview this guy. His name's Gaboo Ted Thomas. And Gabu is no longer around. Um, this was a while ago. He was an, he was very old. But he was like in his seventies back then, I believe. And it was a rather profound meeting because I was just you know I was uh, you know kind of a wet behind my ears journalist kind of wannabe, and, and I was meeting this Aboriginal elder. And I said, "Oh, maybe you can talk to me about the techniques of the dreaming." You know, it's like, "I hey, have you seen?" <laughs> The last wave, the movie by Peter, where all of this kind of superficial stuff, and he kind of stopped it pretty close to the beginning of the meeting, and we were sitting up there facing each other. Uh, and there was a window there between us, and outside the window uh, there was a tree, and he just stopped me and he says, "Look, do you know what a tree is?" Uh, uh, <laughs> it's totally caught me. I've got what a uh, tree is a tree. Uh, uh, and, and he says, you don't know what a tree is. Uh, uh, where I come from, the tree is like your telephone is how we speak to each other over long distance through the trees. So at this point I'm listening because I don't know 
exactly what he means, but I'm really curious because I had never heard a tree acting as some kind of antenna or communication telepathy device. I guess that's the only thing I could think of. And wow, so um, and then he started singing. Yeah. <laughs> just you know, spontaneously, this this and uh, and there was something in his tone that started putting me in this like a like a trance. And I had been doing, you know, paratheater there for, you know, about 10 years. So I was, you know, I wasn't, I freaked out. I was kind of going into the trance, trance with them. And I asked him about the dreaming. And he, uh, he says, we, we don't have any, we don't teach the dreaming. Oh, okay. And he says, uh, the mountain teaches the dreaming. Hmm. And I said, oh, all right. And he says, yes, we, we go to the mountain and we sleep at the mountain. And the mountain is um, uh, called Ayers Rock. There's a Aboriginal name for it. I think it's Uluhuru or something, but it's this huge one piece of rock, this huge mountain in the center of Australia. It's, it's in the outback. Uh, and for him, the mountain, uh, he receives the teaching of the dreaming from the mountain. So the mountain is like this big, huge dream vortex that pulses the dreaming instruction to the Aborigines. Um, and he was talking about the planet as this vastly intelligent entity that has incarnated as the planet. And this entity is a dreaming entity that dreams everything into existence, the insects, the flowers, the birds, the animals, the people, dinosaurs, the weather, everything is in a constant process of being dreamed into existence. And then, you know, he says, you know, when you go to sleep at night, you have your adventures in the dream land. And then when you wake up in the morning, that dream dreamer, is going to sleep in your dreams and is dreaming you awake. And you think you are awake in some real world, but you are being dreamed by your own dream body. And so he was talking about the interaction between the daytime and the dream time as a continuum of dreaming each other into existence in different forms, different ways of, um, of coming to know that you're alive or coming to know that you're dreaming. And so this was really, quite mind-blowing to me. All I could do was, uh, I couldn't really speak. I was just like a, like a little kid taking it all in, um, just uh, joyously. I was just this kind of uh, uh, experiencing this uh, vacation from the normal world, <laughs> whatever, because he was so clear and so uh, sincere. It was, there was no pretense what he was saying. He was just saying it like he was you know, he was opening up a bottle of Coca-Cola or something and just this, you know, matter of fact. Um, so out of that, um, he made it clear to me that, uh, that the earth was calling the shots, that he says uh, that the earth is in charge he didn't really say it in those words. I had to say that because he had his own kind of way of language. But what I got was that the earth has its own agendas and it's his own evolutionary imperatives and its own uh, way of uh, responding and adjusting to its own crises. And part of that has to do with uh, waves of extinction cycles where there's mutations and complete wiping out of species and mutations as constant death rebirth process, which completely made sense, but I had never really seen it on such a large scale. I'd never seen it like on that kind of big picture vision of that he was sharing with me. So that's where it started. And that never left me. There was just something about the meeting. There was a transmission there that I received. Um, that stayed with me. And it put me on a course of developing in my paratheta work, actually, um, a dreaming ritual uh, that I've been working with, with um, 
many groups over the years. Uh, it's actually been documented in a video document called Dream Body, Earth Body. It's actually, a, you can catch it on YouTube uh, or go to paratheatrical.com. Um, and the um, dreaming ritual is really one of um, uh, a certain, it requires a certain kind of dream recall is what, what it recalls. Uh, it's, it's just kind of challenging because you typically when you're waking up from a dream, you, you remember images or sometimes you remember feelings and emotions or you remember faces. But if it's dreaming ritual, it only works if you can remember movements, kinetic properties in, in a dream. And it doesn't have to be movements that you do. It could be a movement that like, like, a, like a branch of a tree, it's moving because the wind is blowing. So it's got this kind of movement. And if you can replicate that movement on awakening, you wake up and you find, okay, how did that tree move in that? So now you've got a dreaming movement, a movement that you remembered from your dreams. So you find three, at least three movements, no more than five. And once you have the movements, you put them together you stitch them together in a ritual choreography. Uh, the first movement, and then the second movement, maybe it's that, and then you connect them from one to another, kind of like chick, chick, chick. You just connect the movements and you have a movement cycle. And then you give yourself over to enacting that movement cycle made up of three, four, or five dreaming movements. And it becomes a kind of choreography, a kind of a ritual choreography made up of movements found in dreams. Hmm. Because the dream movements were not physical to start with. They're images, but they also have energy. It, there's energy in dreams. So what happens in the enactment of the, dream, of, of the ritual choreography, the movement cycle, there are certain uh, experiences, states of consciousness that starts meaning the qualities of the dreams that the movements came from start uh, coming into the consciousness so that as you're doing the movement, you're entering a certain state, an altered state from the power of the dreaming that is contained in the movements that you are enacting. And that there are stages of um, amplifying, going into warm-ups, physical warm-ups, and different kinds of um, paratheater sources to accentuate and amplify the experience so that um, uh, you do the dreaming ritual in a very heightened state and you come in potential uh, meaning the aim is to come into a very heightened uh, direct experience of the uh, daytime dream time continuum while fully awake and physically active. So it becomes a physically active trance. And it comes into uh, the experience of a kind of a sense of unity. You're exposed to that unity between dream time and daytime. It's no, no longer just one or the other, that there's an overlapping through the um, enactment of the ritual choreography of movements that originated in dreams. Um, so that's that was a big impact for me and that uh, uh, that particular ritual has been done uh, wow. by quite a few people by now. And uh, like I said, it, it's documented there. And it's, it's, it's in, uh, also it's in, introduced in a state of emergence as one of the, uh, one of the five uh, uh, rituals at the end of the book of five different levels of difficulty. Is What are the internal experiences that people report doing that and the kind of the state of consciousness they get into while they're doing the the ritual enactment of those movements <clears throat> well part of the part of the process see the ritual choreography it's a structure the movements are specific and so when you're just doing it in the beginning you, the are the movements are articulated you can see each of the five movements and it's very sharp and very vivid but once the power of the dreaming starts infusing your experience, the structure becomes wobbly. <laughs> it starts warping because the energy becomes larger than the structure. And so the challenge there is how to maintain the structure while the, uh, the, 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 the dreaming power 
increases. And so that becomes its own kind of struggle to stay awake and to keep the integrity of the dreaming ritual intact while the ampage is <laughs> increasing. So this is that, that's part of the internal experience there. Um, you know, other times, it, again, it's, it's going to be different for each individual. You know, dreams, um, you know, tend to act in a very personal way, you know, to each individual. So it's a highly personal experience. It's, uh, if there's anything that might be common to all the people that I've kind of witnessed and been part of this with, um, It would it would have to be um, it would have to be a, a, a that we know we don't look at dreams the same way anymore uh, because there's this is no dream analysis there's no trying to figure out what the dream means uh, the whole uh, kind of psychological component uh, that is often uh, used to approach dream work is eliminated it, it, it's not a psychological say what that must be nice it, it is it can be uh i'm sure there's you know quite a bit of use you know with you know freud's work on dreams and jung's work on dreams interpretation of dreams i think can be useful but part of um what i've discovered in doing the streaming ritual is when i do have dreams and i'm not doing the ritual i just have dreams i'm a lot less likely to try to analyze it and far more likely to simply um let the dream itself tell me what it means. You know, let the dream itself uh, come forth with its meaning. And sometimes it will do that a little bit. And other times it won't. It will just say, be off, go wake up, have breakfast or whatever. And then somewhere during the time of the day, it'll come to me. It just kind of surface. Oh, okay, that's that's what the dream was telling me. So I don't I don't mess with the dream anymore. I just like, I have the dream. You want to tell me something? I'm here. I'm listening. If not, no problem. I don't have any problem with not knowing what you mean by this dream. I don't, in fact, part of me may not want to know. <laughs> I love that. And 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 that's and it also sounds like from approaching the the world from that dream time perspective, it sounds like you're not particularly concerned about the world's dream coming to an end. Uh, the world the, okay well humanity you know in terms of like you, you you don't think you think the planet is fine basically well i don't know about the word fine but um i i differentiate between the world and the planet um right. in fact i'm going to read you a little uh, poem of mine uh to kind of uh articulate that's not it's not it's more of an incantation in my book uh last words my final book. Um, and uh, this is actually, um, this incantation is actually uh, part of a, of a film I made called The Book of Jane uh, about this uh, very educated homeless woman, an elder, an older woman who wanders the um, uh, university campus sleeps under a bridge and uh, has an encounter with one of the professors there that uh, uh, is life-changing for both of them. So this is something called the world is not the planet. The world is not the planet. It's the fuzz on the peach, the static, not the signal, the culture, not the truth. The world is a busy, 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 busy place, busy with the business of survival on the planet. The world is burning with business, the hot new buzz of the ultra fizzness, the fuzzy business of saving the planet. But the world is not the planet. The planet is the signal, not the static, the truth, not the culture. The planet is in the business of saving itself from the world. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, to me, the planetary experience, and anybody can come to experience that in nature. You know, taking a walk in the woods, or going down by the river, or 
by the seashore coming into some alignment and communication, you know, with the intelligence of um, uh, the planetary entity uh, happens um, instantaneously and, uh, you know, profoundly. And, and why, you know, uh, uh, I'm out there pretty much every day walking in the woods here in Portland. Part of the reason I moved here is because of the proliferation of forests and ocean and river. It's all around and I just feel more at home here. But uh, yeah, but then there's the world, you know, and the world is um, for the most part um, experienced uh, online unless you have the privilege and the money to, you know, travel, you know, do world travel and you, you get a more real world um, experience by hearing the stories of people in different countries and different cultures. And that's a wonderful thing if you, if you can do that. But for the most part, people have to contend with uh, uh, mass media, the news uh, uh, and so forth and have to kind of wrestle and struggle with trying to figure out what's real and what's not because there's so many conflicting stories and so many repeating stories. It's like why are this- None of it's real. If it's online, none of it's real. That's I know that kind of thing. It, it's a virtualization, uh, digitization of existence. And it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, I actually had a, one of I, uh, my friend Sarah Finn passed a question on to ask you. She's on this note. She was curious if uh, you think there is any space for integrating, like as as technology moves on with things like virtual reality and so forth, if there's maybe space for uh, integration with paratheatrical work or more of the shamanic work, uh, in, incorporating technology in some way. It depends on the technology. You know, paratheater is a technology. So are you talking about AI? Um, I th Well, she didn't specify, but potentially anything. Maybe AI, maybe virtual reality, maybe, I don't know. Uh, probably not. Uh, the reason being is that the, you know, research, you know, the, uh, the influx and the expansion of AI and VR technology and so forth is moving towards the... Um, uh, kind of the, the digitization of consciousness where the physical body becomes more and more obsolete. And uh, the essence of uh, the paratheta work is uh, through the physical body. It's, it's an embodiment bias. It's not a disembodied bias. And so there's a disembodied bias that is increasing through uh, more consciousness being invested online more consciousness being digitized, more consciousness being um, uh, impersonalized um, uh, through um, uh, the discovery of, uh, you know, this really sophisticated AI tech uh, imagery system, which actually can, to me, it's a little scary because there's this, it can produce these kind of drop dead gorgeous images, you know, this, these new kinds of apps and it can completely uh, overwhelm the personal imaginal capacities to create an image you can call your own. And that forms the crux of how uh, the genuine poetic imagination can be stimulated is through um, uh, the creation of, of, of an image you can call your own. Um, and with so much, so much images coming at you that are traditionally quite beautiful with the color and the sophistication and, and making your, your own likeness as an avatar. So you become avatar identified online because it, you, you, your image looks prettier or more romantic or more special than you, how you look in the mirror in the morning. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think so in that way. Um, I think there's always going to be a retro movement. There's going to be individuals that are, all, I think, will always rebel and um, call them, you know, old school or, you know, more body oriented or whatever. But um, uh, I think there will always be individuals that, uh, uh, like, for example, you know, you know how when streaming started, 
the DVDs went out of phase. Yes. However, there, the DVDs are coming back because it turns out there are collectors, there are individuals that care about films and they are becoming bored and overwhelmed with all the content streaming. They, right. want to have, they want to have their own libraries of films that they really like. So the DVDs are gradually coming back. And streaming isn't as good as the DVDs or Blu-rays. So it's kind of like vinyl. Exactly. Yeah. So that there's that. And I think the uh, CDs are going to be coming back too in that similar kind of way, maybe even tape, who knows? Yeah. But yeah. So uh, there's, I think there's going to be a more of a return to quality um, and substance uh, simply by, uh, you know, people reaching a saturation of boredom and frustration with um, uh, too much to choose from that is uh, without nutrient, without fulfillment without satisfaction is this is too much uh uh and it's fun at first you know it's you know entertaining and you know exciting and all that but uh, uh there's a boredom threshold that people have to cross uh, inevitably when um you know when they you know when they go that route of uh, immediate gratification well i think people are yearn for tangible and real experiences and and i've certainly seen uh that has hugely driven people's interest in in magic of all types and wanting to have some type of tangible immediate uh reality hitting them in the face experience and, and perhaps that goes in line also with what you were saying earlier with leaving the leaving the social trance but i want to ask um earlier you asked me what i think magic is but and and i i i I let you off the hook for then, but now I definitely want to know what what is magic to you? <laughs> magic um, to me, um, again, it's not anything from what I've read. Uh, it turns out that magic is uh, the work that I put into making my dreams come true. And so it has to do with recognizing uh, the dreams that are that actually matter to me. Um, I have all kinds of fantasies. Everyone has fantasies and you want to do this and that, but what are the dreams that you can actually realize and make a part of your daily life so that you're actually living the dream instead of just fantasizing about the dream? Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, magic has to do with uh, uh, a certain um, uh, competence in uh, reality-based dreaming hmm. to know enough of what, of what my given limitations, strengths, skills, and talents are to know what I can get away with, basically. To know, like if I have a particular, like for example, every single uh, theater project and film project and book is basically what I've been dreaming up my entire life. I haven't been dreaming of becoming rich or famous or, you know, any, anything like that. It's all been about art and the art life. Um, every single project that I've entered in the beginning stages of it is always a doubt. Is like always this insecurity, like I do not know how, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but there's something in me that is spurred on by the impossible or the notion of doing something that I don't think I can do. Why not just try to do it? I'm intimidated. That's, that's a motivation for me. I'm actually motivated by intimidation right. uh, in that way. And um, uh yeah, okay, let's see. <laughs> and my phone is ringing over there. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to let the phone ring. Okay. Um, so, so basically, uh, each and every project starts out with feeling intimidated. And what that does is it forces me to take stock of my current limitations. How much money do I have? Who am I working with? What kind of setting a life is situation? Can I actually do this with the given existing conditions of my life at this time and if i get a green light that's okay let's do it let's go ahead and do it but i have to constantly reality check myself at, at the beginning of every single project but not before i have this doubt like i don't know if i can do this 
And every single thing I do in terms of each dream, each dream is, uh, uh, it's notched it up, meaning I can't, I don't do well with reruns. I can't make the same movie again over and over. I have to do something to advance my craft as a filmmaker. I have to do something to advance my craft as a writer. I can't just go back. I do horribly with repeats. I don't like to repeat. Um, and so there's that challenge too. I'm always raising the bar. But one of the things that I've learned about confidence, which is, I'm a very confident individual, um, but it's been earned um, by um, basically agreeing to do something that initially that I, I honestly didn't think I could do. Honestly didn't think I could do, but what the fuck, I'm gonna do it anyway, right? Just do it. And, and then make some mistakes as I go along. And that's one of the kind of the great things about the creative process is making new mistakes. You know, old mistakes are not fun. You know, you, you're making the same mistake over and over again. It's like, it's horrible. It was like, it's like death to me. It's like I, I, new errors, new mistakes, bring it on. And then I can correct myself and then I move on. I'm very, I've had to learn self-correction. I think that's probably be my spiritual practice is a uh, constant self-correction. Right. You know, astrologically, I have what's called a Virgo moon for those people out there who are astrologically inclined might understand the self-correction fixation I have. Well, it looks like we're coming to the end of the two hours here. Uh, I wish we could keep going forever. Uh, no, no, I'm all, I'm, I'm cooked. <laughs> and and, singing and, and yeah, okay. I, I, I really, um, I really am touched and deeply honored that you, you spent this time with me and it was, it was a great conversation and it'll be up on video and, and podcast. So anything we should, uh, anything you want to leave us on? Yeah. Um, dreams are important. Uh, find out what dreams are, uh, what dreams you're living for. What find out what makes your life worth living. Find out what, uh, is worth fighting for. Don't fight against anything. Find out what's worth fighting for and fight for it. Um, the realization of your dreams matters. Uh, there's a great payoff in the end. Okay. Well, from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure the listeners too, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you later.